I grabbed an older piece here because when I started looking through the homework, a couple of things popped up. So we talked about structured code and it really is putting these together like Lego. And when I started looking at a lot of the people's submissions for how to play a child game or how to check out something, I started seeing something a little different. And what I saw was scribbles and lines all over. And what makes it easier is if we think of those really as those three things we can do. We have three things we can do. And if we drop and cut and paste them in, if you almost want to think about that, it makes, it makes life easier. So we have the selection, we have a decision, and we have a loop. So we can either go in a straight order, we can ask a question, and the question is where we had a little issue too, and then we can do a loop. And that loop really says as long as something is, is true, and so we're going to talk a lot about in this class about something being true or false. And that's really all the computer can do. So we only have the ability to ask a single question. If something is true or false, two decisions, binary. So anything we do that's got three questions, we're going to have to show you a way we can do that. And so if I ask the question, and one of the card games or one of the games was rock, paper, scissors. If I look at you and you've made one of those three hand gestures and I want to figure it out, is that more than a pair of decisions? Yeah, so we actually have to nest a decision and then move on to figure that out. So we'll look at how we can do that. So I put up these, and so this really is we can create a flow chart. And notice, very quickly, I just nested those three pieces together. And part of that ability to call something structured is each one of those structures. So our sequence, our selection, and if we use a loop, we all go in and out of them at the top and the bottom. Each one of those has a little connector handle. And we go out and in of those, into those at that little points right there. If I am coming out at other locations or doing something else, that's all I can, I can do is go in and out at the top and the bottom of those. Now, this one's got an exit that's really over here on the side, but it, it still is a, a modular piece. And we have to put those in together in little modules. So. If I do some of these as little loops, and we're going to talk today, we're going to talk today about using something called a module to make our lives easier, but we can take very simple tasks and we can put them off in their own little modules. So after today, you're going to learn some new techniques, but we really need to figure out how to break these into structured code. So the other piece I have in your Blackboard if I can get back to it, is there is some samples. And I went ahead and I put those up early. Open, some point. And so those samples have both a pseudocode and they also have a flowchart that goes with it. So the first one is really no nothing more than trying to find a word in a dictionary. Well, you all know how to do that, right? Just like you know how to play those games. But how do I break it down into those steps? And these are the same steps your brain is doing when you look up something in the, in the dictionary. And so, well, the first thing we have to do, open the dictionary. How many times have your parents said that to you? Well, you can't get the answer unless you open the book. Well, here we are opening the book. That is a, which, which one of our three is that? Opening the book. What, what part of the structure is that? Are we asking a question? Hmm. Are we doing a loop? So what does that leave it to be then? We have three different parts. That's all we have in the entire class. Three different things. We have a sequence, 
we have a selection, and we have a loop. Those are the only three things we're, all the way through the semester, that's all we're going to talk about are those three things. So which one is the first step? A selection. Is it? Or is it a sequence? Could I have multiple steps up in there? Could I say, pick the book off the shelf, put the book on your desk. Those things that occur in a specific order are a, not a selection, they're a sequence. They have to be in a sequence. And even if it's only one item, that's still a sequence. It doesn't fit the other two criteria. So then we ask that question. You've opened that dictionary. It didn't say where. And you've asked the question. So now we say, is the item that you're looking for on that page? If it is, what happens to our program? Are we done? We're out. On the other hand, we then ask a question. If you, it's a word not on the page. And notice how we sometimes do these knots and things in here. So you have to think about the logic of how we phrase that. So word is not on the page. So in other words, we don't have the right word, so we go into, now we go into another. Another selection. And that selection is really the start of a loop, isn't it? So is that a while loop? So while... The word not on the page. So that's our loop control right there, isn't it? So as long as we don't have the right word, that loop is going to continue. It leads us into this selection here. So word greater than last word on page. Hmm. Well, we know how to do that. So if you have a word that starts with M and you're on page D, you know that you have to go forward, right? So that's all you're doing here, or going backwards. Because if I don't have, the we know it's not on our page, so I either have to go forwards or backwards to find it. And so this lets us do that. So here it says, all right, we're going to turn one page. It comes back up to the top of that loop, and we, we do it again until we find the right page. Do we know how many times that loop's going to run? We don't have any clue. Depending on how good your guess was when you first opened that dictionary, you may be right on it, or you may be flipping that page a thousand times to get to it. That computer doesn't care. Your brain doesn't care when you do this. Now, in your brain, what do you do? You shortcut and say, hey, I need to go to D, and I know I'm on page Z, and I'll flip back a whole stack of pages. But the reality is you're doing exactly the same thing. So if we look at the pseudocode, Pseudocode doesn't look that much different. We, we open the dictionary, while word not on page. So that's the start of our loop. And then our block, everything to the right of that, if word greater than last word on page, we turn the page forward, else we turn the page backwards. So a decision is an if-then. So if something is true, then we do step A. Else, in other words, if it's false, we do step B. So we can make a decision. Here we have a pseudocode. So this one is very similar to one of the problems that you have in your book that you had for this assignment. So here we say, well, we're going to start and we're going to add item price to total. So in other words, we're checking out somebody. Is this the you got all of the details? No, it's kind of a broad overview. And so we're adding a customer's price of an item into their sale bid. Now, that first one is called that priming input. So it's above the top of the loop. Does customer have more items? If they do, we add another item to their shopping bill. And what I saw when some people did theirs they were able to check out one item. Now, that would save you a lot of money at the grocery store if you were only able to buy one thing, right? But it's going to be a little inconvenient when you're trying to make a meal and you've got 10 items you want to buy. This shows you how we can create that idea that we can add multiple items. And it's this simple loop that we do that. 
What I also saw when people did loops is they forgot the priming input. And I know that's weird. That's probably the weirdest thing we're going to do all semester. Whenever we have a loop and we make a decision like that, we need to get that at the, above the loop, and then we need to do it in the loop. Otherwise, it doesn't change anything. So, customers still have more items. Nope, they're done now. So then we ask a really quick question. We go down to just a selection. Does the customer have a coupon? If no, notice it exits down to display the total for the customer. Otherwise, otherwise we subtract their total. So we've asked a question, does customer have a coupon? Now we're saying, are they paying cash or credit card? And so notice we, if they're paying cash, we take their cash. Here we have a loop to give them their change. Accept the change. Customer needs change. Give the change. Or we accept the credit card. Now there's a lot of other things. Do we ask if they want cash back in here anywhere? No. And so there's a lot of those things we don't. We, it's a pretty simple model. But that's really what we're looking for now, is to break those processes down and start thinking about how that works and how we can translate from that pseudocode and a flowchart back and forth. So depending on the business model, so some businesses, we use these flowcharts all the time to describe how we interact with customers, how we interact with internal employees. Here we've broken it down into how do we get cash from a customer. Businesses do this. They look at what's going on in that business. How can we do things better? So if we look and we figure out that 90% of our customers now are paying with a debit card, can we change our checkout procedures to make it easier for those paying with a credit card or a debit card? Sure. It used to be people mostly paid with cash. Is that true anymore? No, I think that's probably false. So now we can change our procedure to rather than make the, the default be cash, we can make that default be the debit card or a credit card and add in things like, hey, would you like some cash back with that? Why would, as a business, do I encourage you to get some cash back when you go to my business? You get a commission or they charge a fee and you get a piece of it. So do they really just give you money out of your own account for free? No, they charge you. And in fact, the weird thing is, if you think about it in terms of a percentage, if you go to an ATM, what do they charge you now? Three bucks to get your own money? Unless you use your own home bank. But a lot of us run into an issue we use a small bank and there's not a whole lot of whole terminal. And so we're going to pay three bucks to get our cash back. Oh. So, hey, I just got 20 bucks, but it cost me three dollars. That's a big percentage, isn't it? Yeah. But... If that vendor made another dollar, and you think about somebody like, we'll pick on Bailey because she works at Dollar General. Do a lot of people come through and use credit cards? If you think about that in terms of a percentage, that's a great way I can raise revenue. Because the flip side of that as a business, do you get charged when somebody uses a debit card? Yeah. You lose a significant amount of money on those as a business. So it's another way we can we can look at that. So. I have those in and I've got a couple of examples, so make sure you go through and look at those. So including I have one called the Game of War. And so make sure you've looked at how we did these stacked decisions. Because we can only ask a single question with two possibilities. If we have three, we have to use that nested statements to figure it out. And that's where life gets a little ugly. But for now, we're going to show you a slightly easier way. Yes. I have not. Nope. So the problem was last year, I graded a couple of them, and people took my solutions and possibilities and answers and went right back out to fellow students. So now I wait until I actually introduce something in class before I push out to them. I hate to do that, but the problem is. We had some students who didn't want to play by the rules. So we now want to do something a little better. And so we're going to handle, after today, we're going to be able to handle multiple questions. And so there's a couple of scary things in here, and there's some terms we need to deal with. So when I say evaluate a Boolean expression to make a comparison, that sounds really scary, doesn't it? 
No. It's all we're really doing is we're building up what we call, we're going to call a truth table. We want to know if something is true or false. That's really all we're going to do. And we're going to figure out big, horrible, scary things like greater than and less than symbols. So, first thing we need to think about, and the book even points out it when you read it, computers are really dumb. People think they're smart. We use them all the time. But the reality is that programming somebody has written may be very smart, but a computer itself is really, really stupid. Really dumb. So dumb, in fact, that it can't hardly think on its own. We have to figure out a way to make it do something. And so the first thing we got to do is we're going to look at dual alternative versus single alternative. So we ask a question. Sometimes we only have one response. Sometimes we have two. So here I ask a question. Yes triggers it to do something. No triggers it to do something. In this side, only one side of it actually makes any change. Not a big difference, but it does have a little bit of difference in how we write things out. So, dual alternative is called an if-then-else. If-then-else. So, if something is true, then we do action A, else we do something else. So think about that. We get up in the morning and we look at the thermometer. If the thermometer is greater than 75 degrees, we wear shorts, else we wear pants, right? Does that make sense? So if, then, else. A single alternative then, a single alternative, let's think about that. In the morning, if it's past 8 o'clock, I put on pants. I didn't have that else piece. I just had, if it's past 8 o'clock, we put on pants. Otherwise, we don't change our condition at all. We don't know if we're already wearing pants. Who knows? We're just saying a one action. So if then. There's not a lot of difference to them, but it's a little bit of a subtlety we're going to run into a couple of times. So overtime. Does everybody like overtime? Yeah, that's the best part about working is overtime. So this program says, here's how we're going to check if our overtime, if we're going to use overtime pay or not. So what do we make on overtime? Time and a half at least. Some union people make even more than that. So depending on where you're at. So, but we're going to assume, we're going to assume that 40 hours is overtime. So here we come down our statement, we have all our details, and we say, are hours worked greater than hours in a week? If not, you get your hours worked times pay rate. If yes, you get hours in week plus hours worked minus hours in the work week. So you get that portion over 40 hours, and you get that at time and a half. So here's a quick question, though. When I look at that, that makes sense, doesn't it? Seems to. If it was over 40 hours, we, we pay you overtime, else we don't. Why do I want to put hours in a week up there and set it equal to 40 instead of just putting 40 in there as a hard code? Why, why might I want to do that? Since the time you grew up, has it always been 40 hours as full time? No. I write this program and I go to take that program to Europe. Is most of Europe think 40 hours a week is full time? No. What do they think in, in most European countries? 30 or 32 hours. But notice it gives me that advantage if I need to change this program. So maybe every business in the United States lobbies Congress and says, you know what, 40 hours is, is not enough hours in a week. We don't want to pay you overtime until you hit 50 hours. Now I just go up and I change that 50, that 40 to 50, and I can change it programmatically. I don't have those mystery numbers hiding in down here that I have to change. So I always want to put in values up there in the program itself. So the other piece I want to note is notice how we declared it and we made it all capital. 
What does that capitals mean? From reading the chapter that I'm sure you all did on your snow day. What does the capitals mean? So those capitals tell us that with something called a constant. In other words, we're not going to change it in the program. We use it, but we're not going to change it. It's going to stay at that value throughout the program. So it's a value we put in and we use it and it stays constant. We don't programmatically change it. So the same way with our overtime rate. Maybe instead of the business of saying, you know, we want you to work more hours, maybe they change their mind and say, we're going to actually pay you two times your hourly rate on overtime. And we can change it in our program then by changing it in our declaration. So if it's capitals, it's a constant. So this one's not too tough. Does that make sense how we're going to figure that between full time and or uh, uh, overtime and not overtime? And that's exactly how those payroll programs do it for your paycheck. Is they figure out, hey, we've got X number of hours. How do we figure out? Now, there are some places that are more complicated than that, but it's a similar type of logic. And so we have that, that statement in there. How do we deal with, with those payroll? So we're going to try to make some of these a little, little easier. So Boolean really means that it can either be on or off. So that whole phrase, all of that, we're really saying on or off. And the reality is our computer, that's natural because our computer can only think in zeros and ones. Computers can be like a set of switches, on, off, zero, 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 one. So we're going to add some, some elements in here. And these are all familiar, I hope. Any math class, you guys have known what equals means. Now, here's what I will say about our programming language. Because I've also said equals is an assignment operator, right? And it shoves things into a value. And now I'm saying we're using it to see if it's equal. So a lot of languages, computer languages, will use a single equal sign and a double equal sign or some other way to tell the difference whether it's using it as a way to shove a value into a variable or whether you're using it to evaluate so make sure you're, you're kind of aware of that. Some languages are, are different. So we have a greater than, less than, a greater than or equal, less than or equal. And this one is probably the one that is not familiar to you, the not equal. Has anybody ever seen that used as a not equals before? Because they're all like, no. So what it really means is you're saying it's not equal to. So the other one you're going to see is, is this here, an exclamation equal sign. So what you're saying is, there, those two items are not equal, and I want that to be either true or false. And so you'll, we'll see some examples where we use that. So we also have to be a little careful with the greater than and the greater than or equal to or the less than or less than and equal to. So it's fairly easy to make some, some weird logical issues. So if I wrote a program that started assigning grades, so letter grades to your numeric grades, and I said, well, I want those students who are greater than 0.9 to have an A. Greater than 0.8 to be a B. Does that make sense? That seems to make logical sense. But think about this for just a second. If you had exactly a 0.9 or a 0.90 or a 90%, is that still an A? Yeah. So in that case, we would actually really want to use the greater than or equal to. So sometimes we have to be careful about that because you can run into that, that little bit of a logical issue. So we're going to try to figure out how we can use these and combine them. So here we have customer code. So this is that not equals to piece. So customer code not equal to 1. So if they have a code of 1, they get a discount, right? If it's not equal to 1, they get a different discount. Now, could we rewrite that differently? Could you rewrite that in a different manner? So that's where these get tricky, is we can rewrite them. So could you rewrite that with an equal sign in some way? Does 
So right now, you're saying if their customer code is not equal to 1. So let's envision, let's put, our, put your mind around this. So our customer comes in there and their customer code is 4. What discount do they get? So let's think about that. 4 is not equal to 1. And that's true, right? So 4 is not equal to 1, so that's true. So it actually gives them a 0.25 discount. So you have to work your way through. These, these are a little tricky sometimes, the writing of them. So if I would have said instead, customer code equal to 1 in there, what discount would they get? Notice how it, it was giving them a discount of 0.25. Now if I change that to customer code equal to 1, it should be on the other side. It should say, nope, that's not true. So sometimes we want to flip them around. You want to do that desk audit. You want to put numbers in and make sure that you're understanding that, that logic of how we're doing those. So this is the same thing. But notice, what did we do in this between these two? So we changed it to customer code equals one, but where, what did we actually change in this thing? I changed, I flipped those discounts from one side to the other. So logically, and to the computer, those work exactly the same. Which one's easier for us to read and understand? The second one, the positive. We're used to positives. Think about all those tests you've taken, all those multiple choice tests, and when you always have those, this is not equal to these kinds of things. When you start putting those knots, our brain sometimes takes a little harder jump to get to them. So I try to write things with positives just because it's easier for my brain to understand them. So last week, games like rock, paper, scissors, we didn't have an easy way to do it. We said, great, we're going to have to have a nested decision. A couple of you asked this question, and I said no. You said, well, can I put an and in there into my question? And I said, no, not because at some point we're not going to do it, but I want you to understand how that decision arrives. And so an and really gives us two tests. It really is a nested decision. We call it a compound decision. And we need to look at how that's actually going to work. So internal to the computer... So this particular program says, all right, so we're going to give somebody a bonus. And so if I look through here, what we're actually doing is we're going to give them a bonus if they meet both requirements as a salesman. So think about being a salesman. You have to not only sell a certain number of items, but a certain value of items. So not only do I have to sell 100 items, but those 100 items have to be above $1,000. And so some of you may have worked in a commission sales where we had some of those rules in there. And so in this case, to give them a bonus, they have to sell so many items. And so the first question we ask is, did we sell enough items? And if the answer is no, we automatically know they don't get a bonus because both pieces of those have to be true, right? You have to sell both, both a certain number of items and a certain value of items. So in this case, we'll say the salesman did sell his 100 items. Then we need to ask that question, is the total value of everything they sold greater than whatever our criteria is? And in this case, our criteria is it has to be $1,000 in value. If that's true, great, we get their bonus. It outputs their name and what their bonus was. That person that didn't sell enough items, do they get a bonus? No. Or if they sold enough items, but it wasn't worth enough money, so think about that. You're working in your, let's pick on Bailey because she works at the dollar store. They're going to give you bonuses for selling stuff. We know it'll never happen. Don't, don't worry. But, so you sell a thousand 
items. Great, that means you're eligible for the bonus. But then they add up the value of those, and all you've had are teeny boppers buying a candy bar. It doesn't add up to whatever that value is. You don't get the bonus. So in a lot of cases where we need both things true, we can write it this way. So this is the way we would have to write our question about, do they have rock, paper, or scissors in their hand, your opponent? So here we would say, do they have rock? Do they have paper? And if we if they didn't have either one of them, then we could move down to the second piece, right? So we could nest those those equations. We're doing the same thing here. Now we're just saying and in there. So a couple of quick things. Logically, to us, does it matter if we ask if they've sold enough items or they sold enough value? Both pieces have to be true, right? So it doesn't really matter to our brain which one is true. But here's the, here's the rub. So to that computer, those two items, we want to look at them exactly the same way, but we're going to rewrite them just a little bit. So at the top of this structure, we have a 1,000 people coming in, 1,000 salesmen. It's a big company. What we would like to do is every time that computer asks a question and makes a decision, it takes computing resources. The computer gets slower and slower. And so for one person going through there, it goes pretty quick. But now I've got a 1,000 people. And it's asking these questions to process payroll. <coughs> so here, this model, we say, items sold greater than minimum, so we drop off 100 people. So in other words, 900 people sold enough items, right? We go into the, they sell enough over the value of the minimum, and magically, 450 people get eliminated, 450 salespeople get a bonus. So, one way to think about that is the first step we eliminated 100 people. They swept down through our payroll like this. We didn't have to process them in there. If we change that logic just slightly, so now, we ask the question, is the value sold greater than our minimum first? Notice what happens. Now we wipe out 500 people immediately. So over here, instead of 900 decisions we have to make, we only make 500. It's an idea of how we do this for efficiency. So which way do you think is more efficient? And what, the second one, by far because we've eliminated about 500 decisions by doing that. Now, the reality is our computers are generally fast enough for the stuff we're going to do, this doesn't really matter. But if you're writing a bigger program, or your model gets used by a bigger program, if we're going to sort out students at our campus and we're writing a query to do that in database, sometimes we will nest them in a specific order because we use that same logic in database queries, ands and ors. So, anytime I can make it a little more efficient, so think about the IRS, where they're processing 300 million tax forms. If you could make it where it had 300 million less computations, that would make that program significantly faster. So even for small things, sometimes these little bitty decisions make a lot of difference. So, this morning, Bailey's dad's paycheck is getting processed right now. So we'll, we'll pick on the city of Falls City just because I happen to be in there this morning. And they're going through a payroll process. So the city of Falls City has, what do you say, less than 100 people, Bailey? Probably. To process that payroll and go through all those calculations takes that server about five to six hours to process that. If we can make decisions quicker, you can make that process easier. That's a small town. So what if you had Peru, Peru, who's got student workers, employees, and then the whole state college system. The bigger scale, those little, little bit of efficiencies can help out quite a bit. So in a lot of cases, a lot of cases, we don't have any idea. And logically, it doesn't make any difference. Either way works. But sometimes we want to think about how we can do that for efficiencies. So, the key though is this. If an, in an and decision, 
ask the question that's least likely to be true first. In other words, it splits off the greatest number of people. So maybe we want to find out what students in Peru are male and basketball players. Male and basketball players. And so we're going to ask the question least likely to be true first. Do we have, if I ask the question, are you a basketball player or are you male, How many, what percentage of our students are males? 63%, you think, somewhere around there? Let's just make it easy. Let's go 50-50. So let's say we have 1,000 students. If I do that, it jumps off 500 students if I ask, are you male first, right? But what about if I ask the question, are you a basketball player? How many basketball players on campus do we have? Let's say 30. I don't know how many is on the roster of basketball. If I say 30, that's going to drop off. 970 the first time. That's a big difference. So the least likely to be true is the one we want to put in there first. So we can compound these, put these all together to make life easier. So ands, ands are a great way we can combine things because we know that some conditions need to be true. So here's our bonus question again. So now we can really write that so instead of saying, if item sold and we start to nest it, what if we just write it like this? Does that make life a lot easier for us now? Yeah, we don't have to have that nested structure. We're going to let the computer do that for us. So now we're just saying, if item sold greater than minimum and the value is greater than minimum, then yes, they get a bonus. We can actually write these in Excel. Any of you guys done the if-then statements in Excel? No, we don't really get to that. We don't really get to advanced Excel, but Excel will do if-then statements. So that leads us to a little bit of an issue, though. And we need to think about something called a truth table. So as we start getting more and more AND statements, and as we get a little more complicated, we have to come up with a way to determine if that entire statement is true, not just a portion of it. And the way we do that is with something called a truth table. And that truth table says, I have condition X, so my first statement, did we, get a, did we sell enough items? Is that number of items over a certain total? So we have two statements, X, Y, Together with that and, the only way that that entire thing is true is both conditions are true. If any piece of that is false, you don't get your bonus. So think about financial aid. There's a lot of things in financial aid you have to have to get a scholarship, right? You have to have a GPA over a 3.0, and you have to be a full-time student. Think about it that way. If either one of those conditions are false, do you get your scholarship? No. So and statements are pretty simple. Really it says every step in there has to be true. If I had three conditions, all three conditions have to be true. So ands are really, really important, but we can also do it the same way. So here, we have an example of a way to screw this up. So here we have very similar structure, doesn't it? It's asking, are the item totals greater, are the number of items greater? But instead of nesting them, we just put them one after another, right? So in this particular case, that employee would get a bonus whether they had sold the items or not because they would only have to make part of that true. So there are some very common errors that we can do with AND statements. ANDs are kind of our most powerful selection. So if we assign them this way, that's going to cause an issue. So 
So one of the easy ways we do, here we have an if statement. So if minimum for bonus and less than or equal max for bonus, wait, what? Then bonus equals, all right. So here, we don't really have all the operands in them. So those parentheses, remember like we had to do in math so you could make sure you did everything correctly? Those parentheses come in really, really handy. So here it says, very specifically, item sold greater than or equal than minimum for bonus. And, and we almost always capitalize those ands. Item sold less than or equal max for bonus. Bonus equals given. On the end, we usually capitalize the entire word. And you'll see most programming languages do also. That way it stands out and it shows that it is a, a comparison operator. So really, what this says is, this portion has to be true, and that portion has to be true for us to get a bonus. It's not the only logical operator we have. The other one we have is something called an OR, or one of the other ones we have is called an OR. So OR is really very similar. But OR says only one fourth of that has to be true. Either one condition or the other has to be true. So our same question, we want to look at looking at bonuses. This would be a really bad way to do it, I think, maybe. Maybe there's two ways you can get a bonus. You can have sold more than three items, or you can have sold more than $1,000 worth of items. Either way would get you a bonus. And so ORs are a way we can get around that. So ORs, ORs very similar to the ANDs in the way we structure them. So, in this particular case, we're saying if that person gets a bonus, they have either met the item sold number or they have met. So, notice up here when we break it down into that structured loop here, item sold greater than items minimum. So, if they've sold enough items, yes, they get a bonus and it goes down. If they haven't, then we ask that question of, hey, is your item sold greater than that minimum value? If yes, we get a bonus. So ORs, this will give us a greater number of people out normally. ANDs are much more exclusive. They narrow it down. ORs, though, for efficiency, it's flipped around. In an AND, we said the least likely decision should come first. In an OR decision, you want the one that's most likely to be true first. So what we're trying to do is eliminate as many computer decisions as possible. And so it goes through and looks at the numbers again. So here we have a thousand people and we have items sold greater than minimum, 700 people get a bonus and they're down and out. No, 300 people enter and of that, a whole 180 people don't get a bonus doing it this way. So here we just flip that criteria. So to make things even more exciting, sometimes we add things together. We'll show you some of those. So here's our truth table for ORs. An OR statement, very similar, but notice the only way for that entire expression to be false is if both sides of that equation are false. So that's a truth table for ORs. ORs say both conditions have to be false in order for the entire expression to be false. I'm going to jump ahead here because I know we're trying to get a lot of stuff in there. So OR items, so here we have that same thing. We've broken it down from that nested structure. So now we can say, in one statement, if items sold greater than items minimum or their value sold 
greater than value minimum, they get a bonus. So we just shortcutted ourselves. So this is what they call an unstructured piece of that. So here we have the same logic, but we've tried to loop over to a bonus given, and we've made it unstructured by doing that. So that's what I saw a lot of in the homework. Sometimes we have to deal with logic errors. So here we say, you know what? We're going to be a movie theater. We're going to give away a discount. A lot of movie theaters do that, right? And they give away discounts based on age. So here we say we're going to give a discount based on if you're over 64 years old, I think, or 60, whatever it is. Or we're going to give you a bonus based on if you're under 13, a kid's rate. So we're going to come in here, and it says patron age equals or less than the minimum age and greater than the max age. Whoa, wait a minute. Let's think about that. Look how we're writing it. We're saying the patron age is less than minimum age, and it's greater than, can you be both at the same time? No. If, if you could, that would be great. Maybe you get a double discount. But it's hard to be 12 and over 64. So this way, we've written it, you could never have that condition be true. And that happens all the time. People think what they're writing made sense. What we really wanted there was an or statement. If patron age less than minimum age, or their patron age is greater than max age, then they get a discount. So look through, because it's really easy to write ones. So here we have the same question. Patronage greater than minimum age or patronage less than max age. And so notice here what we've done. Here what we've done is we've made it where everybody is in that group. So again, we made a logical error. And so you need to work through some of these when you start writing them down. Because it's easy to do this. You're starting to write stuff down and you go, man, I, I flipped around a sign or two and I, I made that. So here is what it would be correctly done. Patronage greater than minimum age and patronage less than max age, then price equals full price. Otherwise, they get a discount. So we took out everybody except those people between 13 and 64, and they, they had to pay a full price. So that kind of leads us to something to make life a little easier also, that idea of ranges. So we know that in a lot of cases, data falls into a certain range. So grades are a great example of that. When I look at grades, I look at it in this way. So it's a waterfall. So, first one is A's, B's, C's, D's. So I start stripping them off in groups. This one says we get a discount based on certain things. How many of you went online and it says, hey, if you buy one item of this, you get it at full price. If you buy two to five, you get it at a lower price. If you buy 50 of them, you get it at an even lower price. Think about things like t-shirts for your club. You get a cheaper price if you buy a thousand t-shirts versus one. Yeah. We've all seen that. It makes sense. The more stuff we buy, the cheaper that price could be. So here we'd have to set up a range and we'd have to ask questions. So is the items ordered less than range one? So range one is 10 items. So if it's less than 10 items, then they get discount one. If it's less than range 2, which is 24 items, they get a second discount. And if it's range 3, then they get customer discount 3. Does that make sense? We can start peeling them off in waterfall. So think about that set. If, if grade greater than or equal to a point 0.9, you get an A. Greater than or equal to a point B, you get a B. 
And that's really how we do some of this. We write them out and we strip them off. But most programming languages make life easier for us. So here's the, the pseudocode logic of that. So we can always do it that way. So in fact, when we get to Python, you'll see we even have an easier way to do it. But what we're really saying is, if the first one's true, then they get a discount else. And we can just notice inside of each else, we put another if statement. So we're nesting those things together. And so we'll, we'll show you that in Excel, because I don't think you guys have seen Excel yet very powerful. So next week, we'll actually break out Excel to try to show you how we do some of these things. We're trying to break those ranges down into small enough pieces that we can do that. So a couple of issues that fly up. <laughs> you always have to do a path that makes sense. So if my first question, instead of starting with 9, 0.9 and going 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.7, 0 0.6, if I started at the top of that, I said 0.8. So everybody who's greater than a 0.8 gets an A, and then everybody that's we would end up with some really messed up grades. Everybody who managed to get any grade in the class would get an A, right? I won't make that mistake. Yeah. Dang it, it would be good. So those range checks, they have to be a range that's continuous. There are times we have to do them separately because maybe there's an exclusion range or something really weird. You see this all the time. Think about your power bill. You get your electric bill. That's a fun time of the month, isn't it, getting the electric bill? Do we, do your, is your electric bill based on the amount of electricity you use? Do you get a discount if you use more at some point? So you have to use a lot, and there's different tiers in there. If we don't need to ask the question, if we already know that, or we have an unreachable place we're going to ask, don't ask. Why do it? Why do it? So here we say, here's a decision that can never be false. So if it's never going to be false, why ask that question? Why make your computer spin that? And again, if it's one program and one item, that probably doesn't make a whole lot of difference. But if you're processing thousands of those, your MPPD processing thousands of and thousands upon thousands of bills, it's going to make a difference in there. So, inefficiency, we want to try. So notice here, we say items ordered less than or equal to range one. That's our first decision. And we strip out everybody on a customer discount. Do I need to continue asking about range one in my second one? I've already stripped out everybody. I'm asking the same question again. And we don't need to. It's just extra processing cycles. So here we have the same thing but shown in the pseudocode. So we can combine them as many times as you want. Here's the one catch on that. And operators, so this is something new that you have not ran into yet. When you did that whole order of operations, you didn't have Boolean operators in there. And so if I have an and and an or, it's going to look at that and first. And so we need to think about that logic. What's the way around that? these things. Parentheses. If I need to process it differently, I can use parentheses to fix that and make life easier. Generally, I'm going to tell you, if you have multiple of multiple steps, you probably want to break it down a little bit because your logic can get ugly. So you can use parentheses or you can nest your if statements. So the precedence issue comes in Maybe we have something like this. So we're trying to determine about a movie discount. And we're saying, all right, is the rating equal to G 
If it doesn't, there's no discount. So G movies, we know, those Disney movies, they're full price, right? Our next question then is, is your age less than 12? So it's not a G movie, must be a PG. Is your age less than 12? Yes, we're going to give you a discount. If it's no, we're going to ask, are you greater than 65? Yes, you get a discount and you come out of there. But we could nest those together, couldn't we? Couldn't we say, is the rating a G and spin those out? And then nest this and say, if your age is less than 12 or your age is greater than 65, you get a discount to make life easier. We could actually write all three of those together. But the problem is, we have to make sure that that precedent works. And so sometimes it's easier to leave two separate questions. Those make sense to combine that discount. Probably doesn't make sense to add that, that is the movie, a G in there. So we're really working at the idea of how to combine How to combine things in a logical manner. So we can write those code. Come back. I'll do it that way. So there are several things in here you probably need. A, this is an interesting quirk in Blackboard. It has changed all my tests to say online final, which is really interesting. And I have no idea why yet, so I'm trying to figure it out. It's really the week three test, but they all now show up as online final in that header. I apologize for that. It's kind of a weird quirk. So over chapter three, there's a test. Your homework this week, there are exercises A through N, and you get credit for those. And then there's an exercise. You do not need to write a flow chart, although it may help you to draw it out quite frankly, on paper. And you are doing that, that's 13 points out of the 20 for the week, is doing that assignment. So you only have to do parts A and B. You do not need to do, I think there's C and, does that one get a D section also? You do not need to do those. So ask questions, send questions. I will use the discussion board area. There is an instructor's corner in there if you have a question also. Make sure you've looked at that sample code for last week. I will shove out some possible solutions and suggestions on the assignments now that everybody's back and we're kind of back on schedule. Look at those. So for next week, next week, what do you think we need to read? Chapter 4. I know. I just want to make sure we're all on board there. We only read through chapter, is it six in this book? So we're almost done with this. We're about ready to get our hands dirty writing actual code. And so next week, we're going to start showing you a little bit of that Python environment, which you're going to actually be writing code that looks very similar to the pseudocode. We need to break these problems down. All right. Any questions on the homework? All right. I put those samples out, I'll send out some more items for you, and then your homework, I will give you some grades. This first one, I will tell you, I am usually pretty easy on the idea of structured versus unstructured. What I'm looking for is you're starting to break down that problem, whether it's a business problem, a game, or whatever it is. And we base a lot of our class based around the idea of games. And in fact, almost all of our assignments through the book that we're going to use and some other ones, are based on the idea of games. We all like games, right? Does anybody not like games? Cool. All right. All right. Let's get out of here. Enjoy the snow. Slip and slide. Try not to get stuck in your driveway. <laughs>